Now this film's about money, and that could be a fiver, and it is, and that could be a dog, and it isn't. Well, I don't know, <laughs> because I adore, but this one... Now, leave that alone, leave... Uh, that, uh, naughty boy, leave it alone, leave it alone. He seems to have a consuming interest in money. There isn't any money there. They use things in the story of money. Gets himself a spear and goes off hunt. What's he doing now, for goodness sake? Quiet. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That was a near miss. Now, this chap knew how to do spears to swap for, for himself and family. And that brings us to barter. Thank you very much. Where men made the things they were good at and used the surplus for swaps. Now, Lofty wants a pair of shoes, but it's not going to be easy. Now then, Bernie, spears for your shoes. What do you say? Uh, huh? Oh, uh, would you believe it? Bernie wants meat. All right, see what I can do. Now, here you are, dears. Spears for your meat. Bernie, meat. Just Hello, back to square one. Dears doesn't want spears, he wants shoes, and he's got them. Poor old Lofty. Oh, you better try something else. Why not dog selling? Ah, just the job. Now then, Lofty, come on, where are you? Oh, oh, I see, very cunning. Look out, the dog is looking round. Now he's yawning, it's all right. Oh. Now, gently, gently, don't rush it. You've got a good idea there. I like your trousers. Now, steady, steady. Take it easy, now. <laughs> but Lofty had another problem. How do you establish the exact value of a thing? Want a good watchdog, gentlemen? Take a look at those teeth. Piece of sugar on the nose, throws it up in the air, catches it every time, never misses. Now then, throw it as far as you like, he'll bring it back. Isn't he wonderful? Now then, any offers? Five chickens. What do you say? Seven boots. That's torn it. Lofty doesn't know who's offering most. Especially as far as he's concerned, the dog's worth 11 spears. Which adds to the confusion. However, despite these disadvantages, this barter business went on for a few thousand years or so, until the next breakthrough. Instead of the value of a thing varying from transaction to transaction, one dog equals five pilchards. Uh, equals three parts. Equals two loaves and a sack of flour. Equals two axes. Equals twenty-two apples. They hit on the idea of expressing all values beforehand in terms of one particularly valuable commodity. They had invented money. <laughs> That's given the world quite a lot to worry about. To begin with, money was practically anything. And in the Admiralty Isles, they even used dog's teeth. Quiet. As I was saying, practically anything. Yes, teeth, shells, wool, wives, and man's faithful friend, the dog, even. But if this chap is worth so much, assuming you decide to base your economy on dogs, what about this non-standard grey job? What's he worth? Apart from the danger to wealth held in this form, as with any system of measuring, if the standard fluctuates, the system collapses. Inanimate objects are better, something useful or rare that can be trusted to hold its value. Whatever it is, it must engender trust. No problem with useful money. Good morning. Three pounds of cooking apples, please. Certainly. That'll be one hatchet. Oh, yes. Thank you. Good morning. But with useful money, the problem is with smaller amounts. Supposing only one apple is required, what are you going to do? There are 30 apples in the basket. And the greengrocer says, that'll be one thirtieth of a hatchet, please. Well, then, of course, you know he's crazy. I mean, even if you could divide it up, the hatchet would lose its usefulness, so its value would disappear entirely. You see what I mean? He's a mad greengrocer. For smaller amounts, a substance valued for its rarity is much handier for however much it is divided up. If the overall quantity remains the same, the value remains constant. Smaller quantities are not worthless, merely proportionately less valuable. Just right for small amounts. Oh, well caught, sir. You're in the next test. Good morning. A nice eating apple, please. Oh, there's a slight hitch. The greengrocer's not happy. All that glisters is not gold, you know. I'm afraid I'll have to test it against the genuine article. Well... It's an agonizing moment for the customer. It's all right. The coin can be trusted. All that palaver for one apple. To speed things up, they started putting special marks on the money they tested. Result? Trade flourishes and business expands. But there was a snag. 
the moment the greengrocer began to suspect money was not worth quite so much as it was supposed to be, he then preferred to keep his wealth in the form of goods, so that prices rise and trade declines accordingly. This is why money must be protected, produced by honest men in safe places. And for centuries, what's going on in the bloody town? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> of course, most of our coins were minted in the Tower of London. Now, metal in bulk does have disadvantages. It's a bit heavy, sir. Tough luck on the horse. Still, if you possess more money than you can conveniently handle, why not pay someone to look after it for you? The question was who? A man who was used to looking after valuable things, of course. A man you could trust. Towards the end of the 17th century, certain wealthy customers hit on the idea of asking goldsmiths to mine spare cash for them. Good morning. Sit down, sir, if you can, in that outfit. And though it was just a sideline to begin with, Sherry, sir? Uh, thank you. The goldsmiths began to notice several interesting things about it. Customers obviously trusted goldsmiths still. I'll just make out a receipt. I, John Goldsmith, promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 563 quid, uh, pounds. Thank you. And the interesting thing was, after a time, these receipts began to pass from hand to hand. Rather than come all the way back for their gold, customers used to offer their receipt instead of cash. It was backed by gold. The goldsmith had it in his strong room, and you could buy things with it. Nice picture. I'll take it. Here you are. A piece of paper? <laughs> you must be joking. No, 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 look. John Goldsmith's signature. Not old stuffy Goldsmith. A man we can both trust. A man of integrity. Well, well. It's a deal. Good old stuffy. I can either claim the gold or use the receipt myself as money. So, enter the banknote. And as more and more customers took advantage of this new lightweight money, left, right, left, right, and more banknotes began to circulate, left, right, left, right. Who's that on the doorstep? Oh, come on, Stuffy. There's somebody waiting to see you. Chap of the letter for you, sir. Oh, thank you. What dreadful writing. Try it the right way up. <laughs> oh, it's a customer asking me to deduct a certain sum from the gold he left with me to be paid out to a third person to whom he owed money. Here's the money. Third person goes off delighted. Stuffy thinks there must be a simpler way of doing all this. Get the brainwave. Enter the big spender. Good morning, sir. Just a minute. New idea. A book of printed forms. Just fill in the name, date, amount, and sign it. Cuts out all the bother of writing letters, difficult to read, etc. Good idea? Absolutely superb. They had invented the checkbook. Big spenders delighted, so stuffy. Towards the end of the 17th century, more and more goldsmiths began turning over to this new business of banking. Until 1694. Then, war with France. So a group of chaps, no, they're not up for the cup, they're a banking business. They decided to club together and start a bank of their own called the Bank of England. Loaned the government enough money to continue the war. The merchants were allowed to start issuing notes. There they go, it looks so easy, doesn't it? The government's IOU promised to repay the loan over a period. And in the meantime... Yes? Oh, hold on a minute. In the meantime, the merchants still had sufficient assets left between them. Here you are, gold for your notes. To do this when requested. And the war went on. And the country was saved by the Bank of England. Hooray! All very patriotic. But Stuffy didn't think much of the idea. Hold with a minute, Stuffy. Well, this is rather difficult to explain. The acceptability of a banknote depends upon no matter how good this is, it was the backing of the government. Still, they didn't vanish overnight. It took a couple of hundred years or so. In the meantime, there were other lines of business which cropped up. Enter Giuseppe, the loquacious Italian. Let's hear what he's got to say. In English, hello. Ah, a bill of exchange. A form of money Italians had been using since the 12th century to transact their foreign business. Instead of this bloke merchant A in Rome, who owed money to merchant B in York, sending a bag full of Italian lira, which if it got there would then have to be changed into English money, 
Yeah, now take it easy, Merchant B. We'll do that bit again. All right, boys, back again. We'll do it. Start again. That's it. Instead of this, Merchant A kept his lira and sent a letter to Merchant B explaining that Merchant C, there he is in London, with whom he also did business, would settle it for him in guineas. Out of money, C happened to be owing A in the first place. A safer method than sending cash. A bill of exchange is worthless to anyone except a man for whom it is originally intended. It was also a handy method of raising some. For though A may not have required C to settle it then and there, provided C's credit was good, and it certainly was, look at all those hearts, from the moment C had signed the bill, it then became a form of money, which B could take to his banker, and we're back to our old friend Stuffy, an exchange for cash. Bills of exchange work just as well for customers in this country wanting a safe way of transferring money. Although in the 18th century, few people had any problem safeguarding money, since few of them ever handled much of it. Wages were a rent-free cottage, share in the harvest and so on. Then came the Industrial Revolution. In the new industries, wages were paid by cash, so that any risk attached to wealth held in the form of cash now began to affect more people. And it didn't stop there. Industry kept on expanding. And over the next hundred years, as the standard of living rose, the population trebled. More people meant more cash, more cash, more risk, and a corresponding increase in the number of people using banks, where their cash could be changed into the safest sort of money ever invented. Safe and absolutely... What's going wrong? Oh, <laughs> invisible. Book entry money. Of course, notes and coins didn't disappear. Not at all. Oh, quite clever. Put it away before you drop it. People still needed pocket money, but not so much of it. For once a certain amount of credit is entered into a customer's account, compare the number of different ways it can be transferred. By cheque, which everyone knows. The A's cheque is taken by B to his bank. Where's the ping? Thank you. Who returns it to A's bank, so A's account can be debited. By credit transfer, alias Bank Gyro Credit, which is not quite so well known, where instead of writing lots of checks for this laughing bunch of creditors, A simply sends one check to his bank. That's right, make him work. Telling them to debit the total sum from his account and credit C, D, E, F and G's accounts direct. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Same end product, simpler method of achieving it. And the latest innovation, a credit card. Possession of which is a signal to H of A's book entry plus and makes shopping simpler for both of them. One dog basket, neatly wrapped. Good afternoon. Well, there we are. Yes, today with so many simpler and safer forms of money available, transactions in cash are next door to barter. <laughs> We're back with Lofty and his brethren engaged in the primitive exchange of objects. But, once you have invented money, the importance of notes and coins begins to decline. The essential requirement is... A lot of hearts, please. Thank you. Trust. The chap's delighted. So is the dog, having stolen the picture. And that's the story of money. Now go out and make some. And the best of luck.